So looking ahead, 2015 promises to be a time for change in our community. But before we think too far into the future, I'd like to share some highlights of the recent past. Of course, 2015 will be noted as our 100th anniversary of incorporation. It was in 1914 when the village of Grand Prairie was incorporated as an official municipal entity. Over the last year, there were countless events, including the spectacular homecoming weekend, which saw thousands upon thousands of people in Muscassipi Park. We named 100 parks across our community for individuals and families who've made a difference. And we launched the book, The Spirit of the North, which celebrated that 100 years and recognized about 180 people who've helped make Grand Prairie the place that it is today. We also constructed an expansion of Muscassipi Park north of the river, uh, and we're gonna be doing an official opening of that this year, and we have a special recognition for our Aboriginal and First Nations communities that will help us celebrate that. I wanna thank all of the volunteers who helped make the 100th anniversary so special. Also in November of 2014, we launched our Citizen Contact Centre. The Contact Centre combined our existing general inquiries line with our transportation services, enforcement services, transit and the mayor's line, all into one resource. We feel that this has offered a huge improvement and benefit to residents and that it's able to operate from 7 a.m. in the morning to 7 p.m. at night. And in addition to just taking phone calls, they actively report the issues that are brought forward to them and monitor and track the follow-up and progress. They also go through and review our city's website to look for gaps in information. And since the launch, they've managed to field 14,000 phone calls. And most of the phone calls have been able to be dealt with in that first response. So we believe that that's been a big benefit to residents. 2014, we also had some snow. For those of you that live in the city, you'll recognize that we had a change to the way we deliver our snow removal services. And people often ask, so how did it go? Well, and I'll tell you that from my perspective, we probably received about the same amount of phone calls. Uh, the concerns were just different this year. But I will tell you that it has dramatically improved our ability to get out and meet the needs of residents. What used to take us six to eight weeks to complete an entire pass of the community now takes us approximately five days. Getting able to, being able to get through our residential areas multiple times in a year is a significant improvement over past years where residents would be fortunate to see a plow once or twice. We look to see if we can extend that program and revise it. The City of Grand Prairie, and this is a theme that you'll hear through some of my comments, is we look to be a learning organization. Every time we have a chance to improve a service or revise it, we're going to take that opportunity. Early in 2015, the city managed to pass a four-year budget. This is uh, a process that the city has revised a couple of times as we worked into doing multi-year budgeting. And this budget is offset from the council term, so it covers from 2015 to 2018. That four-year budget that we approved includes a $147 million operating budget in 2015 that gradually increases to $168 million in 2018. It also has a $55 million capital budget in 2015, which decreases to $32 million in 2018. I'd like to highlight a few of the things that are included in that budget so people can understand a little bit of what the City of Grand Prairie does with your taxes. One of the highlights is an increase to the complement of city-funded RCMP officers. There's $2.75 million to increase the city complement of officers by a total of 12 members, from a complement of 88 today to 100 by the end of the four-year term. There's $20 million in investment for re rehabilitation and streetscape improvements in our downtown core. Right here, just behind me, City Council is ready to invest $2 million to start the public plaza development south of the Montrose Cultural Centre. And transportation is a priority always for the Chamber of Commerce and it is for residents and council as well. There's $5.5 million to do the twinning of 92nd Street. I know there's a few people in the audience that will be interested in that. Uh, and even more, uh, I think, forefront in the community's mind is 68th Avenue and Council has put aside $6.75 million to twin 68th Avenue from 108th Street to Poplar Drive. There's also $2.6 million in renewal and improvements at South Bear Creek Park. Many of you will know that the city has uh, 
made a change in policy to take over operations of South Bear Creek Park. We believe that it's one of the underutilized and underappreciated assets in our community. We think that after this investment, it won't be underappreciated anymore. So to do all of these things and many, many more, Council approved a 4.2% property tax increase in each of the four years. I want to say something about that. It's important to recognize that this is what I would like to say an honest budget. Council has had a lengthy round of debates about the things we truly want to do. We've set them all out there for the community and said, this is what it will cost. The work doesn't stop there though. It doesn't stop for council or for our administration because we're always looking for ways to do better. And our commitment to you is that if there's any way to drive down those projected increases, we will do that. And I speak with some confidence when I say this, because in the last term where we had a three-year budget, we took a proposed prop total property tax increase over the term of 11.8% and drove it down where the actuals were only 8.6%. So council does have a track record of announcing the projects that we mean to complete on behalf of our community, announcing the full cost of those, and looking for ways that we can find efficiencies and savings to drive down the property tax increases. And we commit that we're going to do that through this term as well. So one of the largest projects, and one that I just previously mentioned, was the $20 million for downtown improvements. Your council is very excited about the opportunities for investing in the core of our city. Our administration has undertaken an assessment of the infrastructure in the downtown to look at all the stuff below ground to give us an idea of its condition and where improvements will be needed. The evaluation has identified the need to replace significant amounts of subsurface infrastructure, including water, sanitary, and storm sewers in the area. Once we address those underground issues, it'll give us the opportunity to reimagine the streetscape in partnership with the Downtown Association and our downtown businesses. The project is proposed to start on 101st Street, just east of Revolution Place, going north. The second phase would be from uh, on 101st Ave, from 102nd Street to 100th Street, and then finally moving into a third phase that would be on 100th Street, uh, sorry, that would be on 100th Ave, uh, from 102nd Street to 101st Street. With all of these investments, we're looking forward to a bright future for our city's core. One of the most important parts of that project, obviously, is going to be the communication with residents and businesses. So it might lead some of you to ask, okay, so why did you choose to start uh, where you did? Council wants to ensure and wants to commit to downtown business owners that we'll have the communication right to ensure that there's as little business disruption during that process as possible. Uh, so before we move to the 100th uh, improvements, the improvements on 100th, we want to ensure that we've gone through it a couple times and we know how to communicate with the business owners and residents about what will be happening in their downtown. Another important part of downtown, uh, excuse me, another important part of uh, in municipal infrastructure is the 116th Street sewer trunk line. Now these are the types of things that you don't think about in your day-to-day -day lives, but for the city of Grand Prairie and our ability to attract development, they're vitally important. In fact, Council has earmarked $4 million from our industrial attraction strategy to invest in this specific piece of infrastructure. The line will uh, be constructed by Aquaterra and will run from between O'Brien Lake and Centre West. And the project is currently at the proposal stage and will be com likely completed uh, sometime in 2016. When it's complete, this sewer trunk line will service more than 1,600 hectares of land in the city. And of that land that's being serviced, 40% of the land is industrial, uh, about approximately 12% is commercial, and about 47.5% is residential. This, also, this line will also support the further growth and development of Claremont by eventually providing an outlet for the overcapacity sewage lagoons in that community. 2014 was uh, a year of some hard lessons. I'd like to speak a little bit about one of them. Uh, Obviously, everyone is well aware of the uh, challenges that we faced at the East Link Center. You should know that uh, Council immediately acted on uh, calling for an operational review as well as a financial audit. We expect the results of the operational review to be done by April, and the financial audit will be showing up at Council within the next two weeks. Council revised the 2015 operating budget to $10.9 million, and that was approved in March. And as we go through, financial, business management, and business planning systems are being modified to ensure future accountability. We're also adjusting staffing to fit the operations and right size it to the way people are using the facility. 
and our marketing efforts are going to refocus on seeking further sales opportunities from our existing membership base. The East Link Center event was a painful, disappointing, and embarrassing lesson. But it's one that we're going to come out of even stronger. So looking forward into 2015, first off, we want to hear a little bit about how we're doing. The Citizen Satisfaction Survey started this week, and it's an event that we uh, initiate every two years. We look forward to finding out residents' perceptions about the quality of life in the city and their satisfaction with city services. The survey is a part of a multi-pronged program that we've developed to improve consultation and information flow between the city, our residents, and stakeholders. The information that we receive can't be undervalued. It delivers key points that council and administration can use in our strategic planning and understanding citizen needs and expectations. We expect the results of that survey by the end of May. Uh, with each survey, administration is required to bring forward ways in which they can address the results and make service improvements. Later this month, the city is going to be initiating a municipal census. This will be the first time we've done a municipal census since 2007. And in that census, our population was, does anybody remember? 50,227 people in 2007. To the next census was a federal census in 2011 where the city had, you guys are, this is not, oh, okay, uh, 55, I heard of 55. Well, to be precise, it's 55,032 people. So, did anybody care to hazard a guess of what we're gonna find this time? So, uh, okay, well, you know, we should, have a, we should have a jelly bean jar or something like that. To, everybody can put in their dollar and it'll be like a great hockey pool. Uh, some of our staff and administration have had their own little bit of a pool and the uh, consensus number seems to be that we'll be somewhere over 65,000 in residence, confirming that Grand Prairie continues to be one of the fastest growing, most dynamic communities in Alberta and in North America. One of the important things about these census uh, numbers is that they actually lead directly and influence directly provincial grants, many of which work on a per capita basis. We've done a bit of an estimation and for each resident, for each resident that we count, it's approximately $250 in provincial grants that the city can expect to receive. So it's vitally important that all residents stand up and be counted. You might wonder a little bit, okay, so what does $250 in the big scheme of that hundred and some million dollar operating budget that I mentioned. What does that really mean? Well, $250 equals two hours of subsidized ice time for minor hockey. It also equals over 270 square feet of asphalt that can be used to repave trails or do road overlays to get rid of potholes. So it is important. It is important. And there's no reason for people to be counted, not to be counted, excuse me, because for the first time, the city of Grand Prairie is gonna be conducting a portion of our census online. So residents will have an opportunity from the comfort of their computers in your underwear or at home in your business suit uh, to be able to be counted. Take your choice. No reason not to be counted. So obviously the economy is a, a big question in our region and across the province and across the country. Grand Prairie certainly isn't immune. While the downturn in the energy sector has had a significant impact on the provincial budget, which in turn is impacting the public sector, including local school boards, municipalities, and the health system, most importantly here, we recognize that it's had an impact on families. We know that there have been job losses in our community and reduced reduce working hours for others. All of this, though, it acts as a signal for us that we have to keep in the forefront of our minds a drive and determination to diversify our economy even more because we recognize that there will always be fluctuations in the oil and gas sector. So let's take a look at some of those other factors that are impacting and shaping our economy. Thinking of the oil sector, the price of oil has declined over 50% since last summer, but we have to keep in mind too that the weaker Canadian dollar has provided a little bit of support to that industry. Oil prices from everything that we hear are expected to recover only modestly through the end of the year. Uh, and Again, just like guessing for the population, I think uh, maybe we need a jelly bean jar for that as well. An important point, though, that I think is un, uh, misunderstood or under-recognized in our region is the importance of natural gas. And in that sector, new energy infrastructure continues to be built. 
Pipelines have recently been announced by Pembina, along with a new gas storage facility by Terrado, and proposed gas plant to be built south of the Wapiti River by Enbridge. These are all multi, multi-million dollar programs that are going to provide for jobs and ac economic activity in our region. And speaking of economic activity in the natural gas sector, Grand Prairie's energy company, Seven Generations Energy, has confirmed its commitment to a $1.6 billion capital spend in 2015. $1.6 billion that that firm is going to spend in our region. Uh, and that means jobs, that means uh, support and investment in local businesses. Another important part of our economy in the region is obviously agriculture. It's been able to partially offset the negative shocks in the energy sector uh, because we've seen livestock prices steadily increase in the third and fourth quarters of 2014. This suggests that cattle and hog farmers are in for decent cash receipts. However, those higher li livestock prices are offset by weaker prices for grain and oil seeds. But overall, overall, agriculture should enjoy a decent 2015, led primarily by those livestock prices. And when I say should, we all know that uh, agriculture is another thing that you don't want to bet on. Forestry is an important part of Grand Prairie and region economy. The Alberta forestry producers have enjoyed one of the best years in a decade. Prices for lumber have been lifted by a strong housing recovery in the United States market and have been helped by a lower Canadian dollar, making our product more marketable in the U.S. In fact, the total value of lumber, pulp and paper and panel board manufactured by the Alberta Forest Products Association members totaled approximately $728 million in the second quarter of 2014, which is up over 10% or $67 million from the quarter of the year before. I think all three of Grand Prairie region producers uh, and forest operator, operators, Canfor, Warehouser, and Norboard, who is formerly Ainsworth, continue to be important contributors to our local economy. Thinking about our local economy, it depends on what you really define as local. If we look just across the border, there's a significant project that will no doubt benefit our region as well. On December 16, 2014, uh, BC Premier announced the approval of the Site C Clean Energy Project, which has paved the way for the construction of the Site C Dam southwest of Fort St. John. This project, not more than two hours away from our community, is an estimated $8.8 .8 billion construction project, scheduled to start this year and continue on into 2020. No doubt, an $8.8 .8 billion project is going to have an impact on our region. Whether it's BC residents who will continue to shop in our region, or whether it's Grand Prairie companies who are able to do business on that project. Another important part of our economic picture in our region is events. We, host the, we have the benefit of being able to host some of the re events that cater to Northwest Alberta and Northeastern British Columbia, uh, and that's something that nobody else has the opportunity to do. Our regional play host to several high profile events in 2015, attracting visitors and tourism dollars into our area. The 55 North Conference 2015 will be held June 16th to 19th. It's going to attract over 200 Alberta based CEOs and executives to our region. The opening of the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum in Wembley this fall can't be underestimated. It's going to be a significant draw for the entire region. And the city of Grand Prairie is proud to be a partner in this important project with a contribution of over $3 million. Our region will play host to the first stage of the Tour of Alberta in early September. This world-class event will attract 120 of the top cyclists in the world and will beam coverage of our community and our region across the globe. Revolution Place will, will welcome seven of the best men's and women's curling teams across the country from December 2nd to 6th for the Home Hardware Canada Cup, as that will be the lead-up to the Scotties Tournament of Our Hearts in 2016. All of those things will fill up hotel rooms, support local retailers and food and beverage industry, and all will contribute to our local economy. So although there are challenges, no question, I maintain that our region is better positioned than almost anywhere in Alberta to weather this storm. So of course, that brings us to the events uh, that have happened just this week. Earlier this week, on Monday evening, Council passed a motion to initiate a conversation on amalgamation for our region. I think it's important to speak a little bit about the context of how Council arrived at this decision and where we'll to go from here. First, I'd speak, like to speak a little bit about history. A hundred years ago, when the city of Grand Prairie was incorporated as a village, municipalities had fairly small expectations. 
One of the first bylaws in the City of Grand Prairie books was about cats. No surprise there. I think the next thing, the next thing, as you'll see this year, was fire. The uh, Grand Prairie Fire Department is actually celebrating its 100th anniversary in 2015. So just a year after the municipality was incorporated, residents were looking for a specific service, a fire service, and that came along. I think 100 years ago, it's safe to say that our region operated much differently than it does today. A hundred years ago, a trip into the village from any of the outlying areas would have been a significant event that might have only been undertaken every few months. The municipalities of the time had to deal with basic services, dealing with off-leash cats, and dealing with fire service, which might have been a bucket brigade at the time, but there's no question that the services that they were expected to deliver were much simpler. Think about our current context today. The world in which local government corporations work is significantly changed from then. We have increased environmental regulations, increased costs, shrinking labor pools, increased demands from residents, rapid growth and in some areas declining populations. We have challenges around the provision of water and infrastructure, plus downloading from federal and provincial governments. All of these make it no simple task for a local government corporation to provide the services that its residents expect. So with all of these things in mind, Council approved its strategic plan in early 2014, which specifically identified that this Council had an interest in exploring alternate governance models for the region. Following on after that decision to include that in our strategic plan, Council acted by taking a tour of Strathcona County. On this tour, there were many reps from both urban and rural municipalities from across Alberta, including some from our local region. Later in the fall of 2014, we hosted a symposium right here in this room called the Alberta Municipal Governance Symposium. The event attracted speakers from across the country, from Victoria to Saskatchewan to Ontario, to share their view of what a modern municipal structure might look like and the experience of other provinces. And if you question whether anybody else in the province is thinking about this, that event was sold out with over 200 participants, again from both urban and rural municipalities from top to bottom in Alberta. You might wonder why there was so much interest in such a challenging topic. It's because municipalities in Alberta are under significant strain and stress. You have to look no further than the eight viability reviews that are going on across the province. This is eight reviews of municipal corporations, towns, villages and others that have had to be initiated either by the local council or by the residents, the electors in the communities because they just don't believe that their local government is viable anymore. The province has been very helpful in supporting these reviews and ensuring that there's a regular process that residents can count on. But the outcome of these reviews could lead to combinations, uh, and these are all publicly available if you do a little bit of Googling, uh, combinations like Manning folding into the County of Northern Lights, High Prairie and Swan Hills folding into the MD of Big, Big Lakes, and the Village of Clyde folding into the County of Westlock. Now viability and a viability review and folding in and dissolving is a reactionary, inherently negative process. And that got us thinking about our region. What can we do better? How can we be more proactive? Got us thinking about what our community really is. Council obviously is elected by the people who live within city limits. But beyond that, beyond that, in our region we work together, we play together, we worship together, we learn, live, laugh and cry together. And in fact, in many ways, the only thing that divides us is the municipal boundaries. For example, there's a teacher that lives in Beaver Lodge that drives in every day to teach at a Grand Prairie school. There's the Grand Prairie volunteer who drives out on a regular basis to serve as a member of the church board. There's a volunteer in Hythe who's intimately engaged in not-for-profit activity in the city of Grand Prairie. There are the employers who live in the county yet pay a major amount of taxes within the city. And there are the employees who live in the city to go work in the rural areas. You can see that it's an incredibly complex system that likely didn't exist 100 years ago. And it led us to wonder, why would we be trying to prop up a local government structure from 100 years ago? That led to our motion. City Council believes that our motion is to do one thing only, to initiate a conversation about what's the best for our region. 
what is the best for our community? And thinking about community in the broadest terms, not thinking about municipal boundaries, but thinking about the people who live and work and play together. That process has to be equitable, it has to be fair, and has to recognize that we are all equal partners. That's why it includes the village of Hythe, the towns of Beaver Lodge, Wembley, Sexsmith, and of course the county of Grand Prairie. It's going to be up to those local governments to design a process that allows us to explore what could be in our region. And it's important to remember, vitally important to remember, that we can't confuse community with municipality. We can't confuse community with municipality. Community on the one hand is all of those things that I mentioned, all those things that we do together between people. A municipality is simply a corporation. A local government is simply a corporation. And I know this, I believe this, because my community includes people who live outside city limits. My community includes people who live in Hythe, in Bad Heart, in Elmsworth, in Sexsmith, in Wembley. All of those people are a part of my community. So as we get into this discussion, the challenge is going to be for us to separate community and local government corporation. I look forward to working with our partners to engage in that conversation. Another challenge is uh, some confusion about the word. Obviously, there's, a con there's two A words at place, uh, you know, uh, in our region. Uh, the first being amalgamation and the other being annexation. And I just want to clarify that amalgamation is a combination of two or more entities into one brand new entity. Think of it as a merger, if you wanted to. Two or more that were before cease to exist and one new one is created that combines everything from the, from the previous. Annexation is different. Annexation is between two parties and it simply transfers jurisdiction of one small area from one party to the next. You can see that one of those two processes is inherently confrontational. Inherently confrontational when one municipality says we need a piece of that municipality. We believe that a conversation around amalgamation can be collaborative and forward-looking because it does mean that we come together rather than seek to divide. And this isn't a conversation that's happening just in Grand Prairie or just at the Grand Prairie City Council table. There are others examining amalgamation. The County of Barhead and the Town of Barhead are in amalgamation discussions supported by the province of Alberta. The County of Leduc and the City of Leduc are also discussing how they might work more closely together. And most, and most, if not all, of these conversations and those that I previously mentioned on dissolution of municipalities are supported by provincial government grants. This will be a process. And I mean that in the most positive sense. At no point has City Council determined what a final outcome is. In fact, I don't think any one of the partners could determine what the final outcome would be. There needs to be a process that engages on an equal footing, all of the local governments in the regions, all of the residents of each of the individual existing municipalities, and our broader public sector. I believe that our most important role as elected officials and leaders is to openly examine what could be. We need to be willing to think into the future and break with what is our reality today to imagine what would be a better reality for the future. Your city council is committed to doing that on behalf of the members of our community who live within city limits and also for those who live outside city limits. With that, that's my 2015 State of the City address and I'm happy to take any questions.